for an organization called uh, the New Leaders Council. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm glad to be here this morning with fellow advocates uh, to announce the uh, MLK Memorial March to Move. Uh, it will be held on April 4th, 2018 uh, at 1.30 p.m. I'll give just a couple of uh, legislative, uh, excuse me, logistical uh, items and then we'll uh, get into the program. The event that day again, uh, we will line up at 3rd and Capitol uh, and uh, that'll be at 12.45 p.m. At 1.30, we will march from 3rd and Capitol to the Capitol steps uh, and begin a brief program uh, at 2.15. The purpose for this march is uh, a couple pieces. Number one, uh, next Wednesday will represent 50 years uh, since the death of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And we want to refer take the time to really reflect on his legacy. And in doing that, I think uh, it is also incumbent upon us to uh, amplify the voices of folks who have been unheard uh, on issues like health care, payday lending, voter voting rights, pensions, education, uh, labor issues, uh, and how we build safe uh, and thriving communities. Uh, we have some speakers here today who are going to help uh, touch on some of the issues that will uh, be discussed at the march. First, we'll have uh, Dr. Crystal DeGregory, uh, who is going to lay a little bit of a historical context. Uh, then we'll have a series of just really important issues uh, that will be talked about by uh, Gay Adam from Save Our Schools, Kentucky. Uh, State Representative uh, James K. talking about pension budget issues. Uh, Dr. Uh, excuse me. I gave you a promotion now. <laughs> Bill Lundgren, uh, leader of AFL-CIO. I'll talk a bit about labor issues. Uh, we'll have State Representative Reginald Meeks uh, talking about a bit about, some of, uh, again, this issue about safe and, and thriving communities. Uh, we'll have uh, Representative Atta Scott come up as well, I think, uh, and talk just a bit about uh, bills like House Bill 169, which we've seen come up in the House. Then we'll have Reverend uh, Clark Williams come the chairman of the People's Campaign and State Senator Gerald Neal will uh, wrap, us, uh, wrap us up with final thoughts. First, uh, Dr. DeGregory, can you come? Thank you. Long before streets in every uh, major American city bore his name, long before his widow, Coretta Scott King, struggled to keep his legacy alive, secured the recognition of his birthday as a federal holiday, long still since his statue stood tall on the National Mall the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was an enemy not only of state sanctioned racism but also of the state in the more than 50 years that have come and gone since Dr. King marched arm in arm with Kentuckians on the streets of our own Frankfurt to this very capital some have forgotten his call for this nation to live up to its creed Others have forgotten its blank check. And others still have forgotten that democracy is an unfinished ideal so long as pastors and politicians do not see people who do not look like them, live where they live, or believe what they <coughs> believe as deserving of every human dignity and of respect. For so long as difference is deemed deficiency, those who labor in the cause of freedom, justice, and equality cannot rest. Indeed, we who believe in freedom must remind ourselves and others that marches are not mere tokenism. Scores of good people have suffered bad consequences, have been harassed, have lost their livelihoods, and have even lost their literal lives, all because they marched. And so, March, 50 years after an assassin's bullet forever silenced the dreamer, we march. We march because some of us still believe that as long as there is racism, sexism, homophobia, and transphobia, so long as there is joblessness, homelessness, and hunger, so long as access to clean air and to clean water and to health care is not a right that every American enjoys, so long as there is sexual violence in homes and in churches, so long as the standing to the words of the national anthem is deemed more important than the standing up for the value of the lives that those words symbolize, 
so long as there is gun violence on city streets and as children are being mowed down with semi autic weapons by other children while they attempt to do what generations of us have done in peace, and that is to learn in schools. So long as we say we believe in the dreamer, every generation must, in word and in deed, demonstrate anew. We believe in the dream. And so, we must. My name is Gay Adelman. I'm with Save Our Schools Kentucky. And a, an expression came to mind recently that rings true here today. It's expensive being poor. Predatory lending, higher costs for loans, bank fees when you're poor, these things are much harder to overcome. And they compound and continue to compound. Kentucky is a poor state. And that analogy applies to our state as well. When we don't invest in our public schools, it's expensive. We make an expensive mistake when we don't invest in public education. Kentucky can't afford the same cuts to funding that other states have endured, yet our education funding is still at pre-recession levels. Our schools are broken on purpose. There's a false narrative. Uh, it's part of a national playbook to cut funding to public schools, label our schools as failing, so that predatory, similar to predatory lending, charter schools can come in and profit from our, from our poverty, from our Poverty, yes. It's a playbook and it's a shame to see it playing out here in Kentucky. There's a reason the NAACP has a moratorium on charter schools. They take money and resources away from public schools and unlike charters, public schools serve everyone. These charter schools disproportionately affect our minority children especially. They resegregate our schools and we also have uh, part of this predatory practice, we also have a scholarship tax credit that's trying to creep its way into some of our bills, even in these final days of session. They're still trying to find a way to, to sneak that predatory practice in. We have well-intentioned lawmakers with no experience in public education, no experience in public schools, predict, or dictating unfunded <coughs> mandates with unintended consequences. Instead of funding back-end, punitive, restorative, expensive measures, I shouldn't even say restorative because what we really want is restorative in the front end, not punitive, reactionary measures in the back end. We need to be funding our public schools, not charter schools. Fund our textbooks, not metal detectors. Arm our teachers with resources they need to be successful so we don't have to get to the point where we're talking about these reactive solutions. They are much more expensive and much more punitive and they affect our most vulnerable. The school to pipeline, school to prison pipeline is real and it can be avoided if we invest in these front-end supports and resources. Instead of investing in our children, we're divesting in them. Let's invest in smaller class sizes, early childhood intervention, textbooks, mental health counselors, trauma-informed care, friskies, restorative practices, art, music, deeper learning, trades and project-based learning. Not the back-end charters and high-stakes tests and the things that, that harm our most vulnerable children the most. Frederick Douglass once said, it's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. The interests of the people are being ignored. The voices of the people are not being heard. Thank you. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Before I get started, I'd like to recognize a few of my colleagues in the House and Senate. From the State Senate, we have Reggie Thomas. Uh, we have my seatmate. Uh, from Louisville, or from, from, <laughs> Whoa. excuse me, from Lexington in Fayette County, Representative George Brown. He wants to be. We have, cool. from Louisville, we have Representative Reggie Meeks, we have Representative Jeff Donahue, we have Representative Daryl Owens, and we have Representative Attica Scott. We also have with us our House Democratic floor leader, Mr. Rocky Atkins from Elliott County. So I want to thank those members of the House and Senate for being here this morning. <laughs> here to honor and remember and carry on Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s legacy. And we do that on April 4th with a march here in Frankfurt. And to carry on his legacy, we carry on his work. Dr. King believed in the value and dignity of hard work and service. He believed in the power of public employees. He fought for their wages. 
for equal treatment, and yes, Dr. King fought for public employees' pensions. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons he was in Memphis when he was shot down fighting for sanitation workers and their rights. Foundationally, Dr. King believed that work, that employment, that careers should leave individuals with a sound quality of life, that a career should allow someone to more than survive, but to persist and thrive and provide for their family. He espoused the importance of quality of life in retirement and old age, after the gifts of labor have been spent. We believe that Dr. Martin Luther King would support the promises made to Kentucky's public workers. He would not support cuts in pay and benefit. He would not support the state not properly funding pensions. Diminishing pensions, cutting pay and benefits for workers, and breaking legal promises to Kentucky's employees disrespects hard work and casts indignity upon labor. More importantly, it creates greater struggles and a disproportionate impact on those who are already poor. That's right, in Kentucky we have many working poor that actually serve our commonwealth and earn pensions. And we want the working poor to try to help to pay for the failures of the past. We have good plans like my Kentucky Promise Plan that dedicates streams of revenue like an opiate tax to our pensions. It cuts excessive government salaries in the executive branch for political employments. It cuts pensions for lawmakers. It brings common sense funding without hurting the poor or the middle class families with burdensome income or sales tax. Dr. King recognized and promoted the power of education as a way to fight the ills of injustice, of inequality, and of poverty. The failure of state government to fund our pensions for public employees has created serious budgetary strains, particularly on public education. Our schools are already growingly inequitable. We have poor schools, we have poor counties, we have poor cities, and we have poor governments across our state. The poor children in those communities suffer the most. Those who are from racially minority backgrounds, racial minority backgrounds, are falling behind more than the white students. We need a fair tax code. We need dedicated funding to our pensions because we need to invest in our schools, in our communities, to bridge the achievement gap between those who are poor, those who have different color skins, and those who are all, all of us Kentuckians. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Bill Lodge, again, the president of Kentucky AFL-CIO. I'm here on behalf of all the working families in Kentucky, and we're proud to stand with the People's Campaign uh, and their march as it comes up here on April 4th. You know, we will be having a significant march as well and many activities in Memphis on, on, on April 4th uh, with the labor movement from across the country. And we're proud to support this campaign as we were when Martin Luther King marched in Washington and across the country. He stood with organized labor, A. Philip Randolph, Walter Ruther, and many other great labor leaders that stood hand in hand and side by side with Martin Luther King to stand up for workers' rights because Martin Luther King recognized that workers' rights are civil rights and civil rights are workers' rights. And you cannot have one without the other. He stood against all the things that we're facing today, the rollback of wages, of benefits, of health care, of pensions. He stood with workers and had that strong message of unity and solidarity. He recognized that right to work was a divisive strategy born out of Jim Crow laws that wanted to divide workers against workers, white against black, in the workplace. Let me just mention one of his quotes about the labor movement. He said, the labor movement was the principal force that transformed misery and despair into hope and progress. Out of its bold struggles, economic and social reform gave birth to unemployment insurance, old age pensions, government relief for the destitute, and above all, 
new wage levels that meant not mere survival, but a tolerable life. Dr. King would stand with us today to fight for pensions, for increasing the minimum wage, against the repeal of prevailing wage, against right to work, and stand with workers. He said also, and I have, I'm so glad to be able to quote Dr. King because his words are almost like music and uh, magic to me when I read them. In our glorious fight for civil rights, we must guard against being fooled by false slogans such as right to work. It provides no rights and no works. Its purpose is to destroy labor unions and the freedom of collective bargaining. We demand this fraud be stopped. And we stand with Dr. King and his legacy to demand so many frauds be stopped right now. And we are so pleased and happy that we have a continual recognition of Dr. King's life work and his legacy as it stands for working families of all colors and all races and all creeds and all backgrounds. And that is, I think, the message that we need to deliver when we go forward from here, that we stand with the legacy of Dr. King in his great work and his 50 years from, from when he was killed. Uh, his legacy is still alive and well. And we want to continue to support it. Thank you. Good morning. Morning. Good morning. I am so proud to see my colleagues, my leaders um, here today, and I thank you all for being here in the media. Thank you all for being here because it's important that we get this message out. I um, represent a generation of, of people who feel like at times, why are we marching? Why, why do we have to do this? We're looking backwards, we should be looking forward. And I, as I teach students, I understand that we have to be the bridge between the Dr. King generation of getting out there, putting your feet in the streets, and the present generation that doesn't see why necessarily they need to be out in the street as well. I think that one of the things we see today is that we, we're seeing young people recognize that they need to step forward and be their own voice, as Dr. King represented all of us and is the voice. I want to talk a little bit about building community. I come from a community that uh, was so encouraging, nurturing. Um, you know, when you go to church with teachers, when you see them in the stores, when you go to the barber shop and you see your principals and your teachers sitting next to you getting their hair cut, when you know that your parents are socializing with uh, leaders in the community, you just feel like you're a part of something that's much bigger than yourself. And we've gotten away from that in so many ways. And so to the extent that my participation in this coming March will help be a, a, a bridge so that young people feel the empowerment that Dr. King was all about. He was all about empowering yourself, your community, your state, your city, and the bottom line is we all, this entire country, was better off if we do that. It, uh, exercising your civil right, your voting right, your human right, holding government accountable, all of these were things that Dr. King said to us in his living. Civil right for one was a civil right for all. And the diminution of that right to one was a diminution of that right to all of us. And he tried to tried to make this country see that you weren't necessarily taken away from one, you were given to all. Um, and that was an important message that, that our young people seem to be getting today. And I, I appreciate so much the people's movement for understanding how we must message this march, this work, and these challenges that we face here in Kentucky um, so that they understand, they have a stake in this. And, and, and I'm so proud of the young people, uh, both in Parkland, Florida, and in Louisville, Kentucky, and in Lexington and other cities, where they see themselves as being not just victims, but being advocates. Um, and they're making us, those of us who are supposed to be looking out for their interests, they're making us see our work in a different light. 
Dr. King was all about building up communities, rural communities, urban communities. He was all about working across lines of race, economics, religion, and those were messages that were as important, to, that probably are more important today than they were then. Everyone has something to contribute. And so working across party lines, working across racial lines, working across lines of economics were all things that Dr. King was all about and the message of Dr. King's living is as important today as it ever was. And I'm proud to be a part of a movement that is keeping that message alive and helping to build bridges uh, throughout this Commonwealth. Despite what we're getting from the first floor of the, <laughs> of the Capitol and uh, the governor's mansion, we all are in this together. And it's not as a dictatorship, it's as a working partnership. And when we understand that, and I hope this message, this march, will be a message that says we have to work together to uh, to make this a better commonwealth for all of us. And I thank you all for your work, and I thank you all for letting me be a part of it. Thank you. I come to you this morning angry that yet another black man has been killed by police shot 20 times because he was armed with a cell phone. I come to you angry because far too many people will leave today and prepare for next week's march using quotes by Dr. King designed to tell black folks don't turn over the tables like Jesus did because another unarmed brother was shot and killed by police officers. Protest peacefully. I come here angry because peaceful protest doesn't mean that I lay on the ground and and ask you to push your boot deeper inside my throat while I'm laying on the ground. Peaceful protest means that I'm gonna make sure you know that I'm angry because in my second year as a legislator, I've seen time and time again that bills are filed to keep boots on the necks of people who look like me. Whether it's a neighborhood schools bill designed to resegregate our schools, that's a boot on the neck of black folks to tell us stay in your place. Don't come out here where you don't belong. We're gonna make sure we're in busing so you can't make your way out here where you're not wanted or welcome. And that brings us to this year where we have House Bill 169, the gang bill that's designed to lock up more black and brown kids because you know we do need some bodies to fill up these three private prisons, don't we? Mm. When we have in Oldham County, the Humane Society having fundraisers, sleepovers with grown people in a detention center that's designed to lock up more immigrants and more black folks. I'm angry. And I'm the Dr. King kind of angry. And I'm the Jesus Christ kind of angry that wants to turn over this table every time I have to sit here and listen to someone try to justify why our lives don't matter as people of color. And I also know if we do the work together of truly building the beloved community of which Dr. King spoke, I won't have to stand here and continue being angry for the people who can't be here, who can't make it out this morning. I know for the brown kids and the black kids and the Asian kids who are in rural communities who are either shown by the actions of their neighbors or told that you are not wanted, that you are loved, and that you are part of the beloved community. And you do have legislators here and good people across the Commonwealth who are saying we reject racist and hateful legislation. I want you to know to the little brown kids and black kids who are in schools where you're being forced out into streets where you have no choice but to join a gang for safety, that we care about you and we're dismantling this school to prison pipeline gay because our kids and our babies are much more important to us than fueling a system that was not built for or designed for us but was built by us and I'm here to say that I believe in the Dr. King vision and dream of all of us uniting together for not only a better United States but a better Commonwealth of Kentucky doing that by 
lifting up one another. Doing that by saying, it is not okay. It is not okay that we can count on one hand and a couple of fingers how many black folks serve in our legislature. 50 years later, we still have a long way to go, folks. But in November, in November, we can make a difference. In November, we can make sure that we elect people of color to come here to Frankfurt to say no more, to say enough, to say that we will build a different and better Commonwealth together. I appreciate the opportunity to bring my righteous anger before you this morning. And my righteous anger will continue to be in these committee rooms and on the House floor because I have that right for the people who sent me here to Frankfurt. And next week when you march, I hope you march with that righteous anger that says no more, that says enough. Thank you. I want to thank everyone for everything again. I'm Clark Williams, I'm the president uh, and the chairman of People's Campaign and the People's Campaign Community Network. My favorite sermon was preached in January of 1972, which happens to be one year, one month, and almost, I guess exactly one week before the day that I was even born. Obviously, I heard that sermon via recording. But the sermon was preached by Dr. Gardner Taylor, a dear friend and mentor of Dr. King, on the occasion of a memorial service on Dr. King's birthday. In that sermon entitled, The Strange Ways of God, Dr. Taylor said that it would take at least 50 years to begin to assess the impact that Dr. King's life has had upon America. And so how strange it is and how eerie and how prophetic even it is that that 50 year mark would come at such a time as this. A time that is filled with so much hatred and so much ugliness and so much division and unrest. And at a time when the interests of the people are being ignored and the voices of the people are not being heard. The King holiday has become a time when everybody is polite and everybody is made to feel comfortable. But part of our job in furthering Dr. King's legacy through this MLK Memorial March to Move is to say and do some things that will make some people feel uncomfortable. There was a preacher, another preacher, in Germany by the name of Martin Niemöller. And Niemöller said in the 1940s, first they came for the socialists. And I didn't speak out because I was not a socialist. And then they came for the trade unionists. Mm -hmm. And I did not speak out because I was not a member of a trade union. And then they came for the Jews. And I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. But then one day they came for me. And there was no one left to speak for me. Well, right here in this building, and in the building next door and across the street, they came for the people who lost their voting rights. And collectively, we did not speak out because collectively, most of us, we had our voting rights. And then they came for the people who are members of unions. And collectively, we did not speak out because collectively, most of us are not members of labor unions. And then they came for the people who needed health care. And collectively, we did not speak out because collectively most of us already had our health care. And then they came for the public schools. And we did not speak out because apparently we collectively and erroneously believe that all of our children will somehow end up in either private or charter schools. And then they came for the teachers. And collectively, we did not speak out because we are not in education. 
and then they came, now they have come uh, for the pensions. And collectively, we have not spoken out yet because uh, many of us, we do not have pensions. We have 401ks. And now they're coming for the people who will lose their jobs. But collectively, we have not spoken out because we think that we have some job security. And right now, through House Bill 169, they are coming for the people who fit a certain profile of being gang members. But collectively, we have not spoken out because some of us don't believe that our children would ever be mistaken for being gang members. And so surely we can see enough of a pattern here by now to know that some of our elected officials, not all but some, are going to come for us. And if we don't speak out now, there will be no one left in a position to speak for us when the time comes. In that last speech, Dr. King said, I might not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. But in order for us to get there, we have to come together to do better. And that is what the MLK Memorial March to Move is designed to do. Thank you. Well, there you have heard it. My name is Gerald Neal. I serve in the Kentucky State Senator Senate with my friend Reggie Thomas. Uh, Bring greetings to everyone that's here. I look around the room, I see the uh, 